and welcome. I'm Elizabeth Vale. Um, this is our public policy and practice series uh, at the Fellows Institute of Government. Um, we are here with David Rubenstein tonight, who is one of my favorite people in all the world, uh, and really one of the most amazing Americans, I think, today. No pressure, David. Um, I want to thank Kathleen Hall Jamison for her wonderful space here at Annenberg, which we are very grateful to borrow tonight. Um, also, Nelson Lim, who's in the front here, who runs Fells. Thank you, Nelson, for being my muse and my inspiration for this class. Um, and also our great staff at, at Fells, Josh and Cassie and others who are here. Um, as you probably know, we've been uh, doing these for a number of years now, and this is our last in this season, and really, um, I think, possibly our best, but thank you for being here for it. You probably know the drill, which is that I uh, get to ask questions for about 45 minutes or so, and then you get to ask questions. Um, so please remember, when I looked to you, I don't want blank faces or no more alcohol, okay, afterwards. Um, but let me just quickly introduce David, and then I'll start with my question. So thank you, David, for being here. It's a joy to have you. Um, I think you all have his bio, but it is so remarkable. I get three minutes to talk about his bio, because it's just, he's basically eight people. Um, David is currently co-founder and co-executive chairman of the Carlyle Group, which is one of the world's largest private equity firms, has been at, uh, on many occasions the largest. I think you're 175 billion in assets, is that right about now? Bigger than that, but I don't want to... 180 billion? Uh, it's more billions than most of us have. Uh, 31 offices around the world. Uh, David is from Baltimore, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, went to Duke and the University of Chicago Law School. I learned earlier this evening that he got into Penn Law School, did not go, which may be why you weren't such a great lawyer, David. I know you'll tell us that later. <laughs> anyway, um, and then practice law very briefly. Um, went into the Carter White House uh, at the age of 27, I think. And David was, I love talking about him in the third person. David was the um, deputy assistant to the president for domestic policy at the age of 27 in the Carter White House. I think you turned the lights out too, as I recall. We'll talk about that. Um, then you went back briefly and practiced law again. Um, not, we'll talk about that in a sec. Um, and then founded Carlisle uh, at the age of 38? Seven. 37. Um, and uh, it, it, the rest is history. Uh, we'll talk about Carlisle. So that's the first part of the bio is, is education and work. David's boards are unbelievable and his philanthropy. Um, I actually looked it up. You have 50 line items. I will not read them all, but an right. astounding, <laughs> astounding board work. Um, you are chairman of the Kennedy Center, the Smithsonian, the Library of Congress Madison Council, which is in effect head of the Library of Congress, um, trustee of the National Gallery of Art, chairman of the Council on Foreign Relations, fellow at Harvard, uh, University of Chicago, Sloan Kettering, Johns Hopkins, Lincoln Center, president of the Economic Club of Washington, vice chair of Brookings, former board chair of Duke, um, and there's another 40 or so, so I won't read them all to you. Um, when I first met you, by the way, I remember David, you said, I said, David, I was introducing you at something, and I said, how can you be on all these boards? And you said, look, I just read a study that said a man of my age, you were 53 at the time, I recall, uh, you said, I'm 53, I just read a study that a man of my characteristics, my age, Jewish, blah, 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 will live another third. So I'm incubating what I want to do with my last third. I'm getting on all these boards. I know they don't want my time. They want to check, and I'm going to figure out what to do with, with that. And so it appears that what you did is your patriotic philanthropy, which is the third part of your bio. Um, astounding patriotic philanthropist, second to none. Um, you probably all know uh, David has bought and shared with the country um, his mag a, the only Magna Carta, the only copy of the Magna Carta outside of England, is that right? Or outside of, or in private hands. It's the only one in private hands. In private hands, um, which he has bought and shared with us. It's in the archives. Um, you also shared with us your Emancipation Proclamation, which you gave to President Obama and ha hung in the Oval Office, uh, your Declaration of Independence, your 13th Amendment, your oldest book, is that right? The oldest map. Et cetera, et cetera. So I want to know, we'll talk about what's next, uh, if there's anything left. Um, also, your restoration of monuments. As you may know, David um, helped restore or basically restored the Washington Monument after the earthquake. Uh, the Lincoln Memorial you're doing, you've done Monticello, um, Mount Vernon, and on and on and on. And then there are the pandas and the elephants in the zoo. All which right. We'll have to find out what, other, what your next species is. Uh, my last point of the bio is that David was honored in a surprise in November by the five living presidents of the United States. 
who said, thank you, we are, we, uh, America thanks you for all you have done, which is pretty amazing. Okay. So I now know who to invite to my eulogy. Um, <laughs> You can, you can deliver my eulogy I can, you better than anybody else, right? I can deliver, well, wait, I'm not done. <laughs> no, I'm almost done. Um, President Obama said he is proud to call you a friend and to watch the Washington Monument restoration out of the window with his family and the, um, the uh, beginning of the um, African American Museum of which you were the anchor gift. Uh, and the last thing is David has a Bloomberg TV show, which you must watch. Next time we'll have a quiz on the Bloomberg TV show. He's interviewed 29 people, and they are amazing. It is amazing. Obama, no, not Obama yet. You've done Clinton, Bush, Yo-Yo Ma, Oprah, et cetera. So that's an okay. incredible, incredible I'll background. Everybody else. Okay, now you can leave. No, 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 that's an amazing, amazing background, Dave. Thank you for being here. Okay, first question. Can we go back to the beginning and tell us a little bit, just a little bit about your family? Sure. Um, you're from Baltimore. What, what was their recipe for creating you? My, um, you know, if your last name is Rubenstein, you might think this person is the son of a doctor or lawyer or some professional. But I'd like to remind people that there are blue-collar Jews, and my father was one of them. Uh, he dropped out of high school to go into World War II. He came back. He met my mother. They got married relatively quickly. Uh, she was 17. He was 20. I was born more than nine months later. <laughs> um, and I was their only child. My father, because he didn't have a high school education, uh, had a hard time getting a, a, you know, a job that paid him very much. So he worked his entire life as a postal clerk in the U.S. Postal Service, made no more than seven or $8,000 a year when I was growing up. Um, but I got the un unconditional love of two parents, which if any of you have had that, you know, that, what more do you need in life? So when I was growing up, I thought, I don't have the wealth of some people I know. I don't have the contacts. I don't have the uh, athletic skills. I don't have the looks. But I thought that I believe in the American dream and that if you worked hard, you could make something of yourself. And my parents didn't disabuse me of that. So I just worked hard. I got very lucky. And uh, you know, now my main thing in life is to give back to the country, which enabled me to come from very modest circumstances. Uh, my last name was Rubenstein. Elsewhere, I might not have been able to do it. Now, actually, I'd like to tell people that my last name might not have been Rubenstein. When my ancestors were coming over to Ellis Island, they were not that smart. Uh, their last name was Rockefeller, and they said, no, we don't want a name like that. We want a nice ethnic Jewish name, so give us something different. So we went from Rockefeller to Rubenstein. No, no that's not true. But, but, um, so I, I got very lucky in life, and many people who um, have what is considered success got lucky in life. Everybody um, had some kind of luck along the way. Nobody is so talented they could do anything without luck. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. Um, so David... Then you went, oh, eventually, you went, you went to school and this and that, but then you got into the, into the practice of law for a while and, and, and to the White House. Now, David, you're only known for success. I mean, everybody knows you're like, you, you climb mountaintops like nobody I've ever known. But you failed a little bit, didn't you? Tell us about your failures. Well, what happened was, um, I, some of you may be my age or older or maybe near my age. Um, when John Kennedy was inaugurated in 1961 on January 20th, he gave an inaugural address that was, I think, the best inaugural address of the 20th century. And maybe fam famously, he said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And that was a 14-minute speech. It was written by, really, Ted Sorensen working with President Kennedy. My sixth grade teacher went over it with my class, word for word, line for line, and convinced us it was really poetry in prose form. And the idea of giving back to your country was something that it kind of instilled in me, the, the notion of trying to do. When you were growing up in the kind of blue-collar environment in Baltimore, maybe like not unlike growing up in a blue-collar environment in Philadelphia, you didn't aspire in the sixth grade to go run a hedge fund, um, as important as that social good is. Or you didn't aspire to go run a private equity fund or start a technology startup. If you wanted to go into business, you went into your family business, or you went to um, Procter & Gamble and you worked your way up, or you didn't over 30 years or so. So nobody really thought if they wanted to do something with their lives, they were going to go into business in those days, relatively speaking. So the idea was you might become a lawyer or a doctor, but if you're a lawyer, you might go into government service. So my idea was to go into government service and give back to the country, inspired by President Kennedy. And some of you, no doubt, were probably inspired by President Kennedy and, and that famous speech. And so my goal was to become a lawyer, go into public service, and you know work in the White House if I was lucky to do that, but somewhere in government, and try to make the country slightly better with whatever skill I might have. And that was it, not making a lot of money. It turned out that I wasn't that good a lawyer. Um, 
to be a, to be a good lawyer, you have to have certain skills, and I did okay in law school, but I, I wasn't a superstar. And when I went to practice law in New York at Paul Weiss, that was the firm that Ted Sorensen, who had written John Kennedy's inaugural address, was actually at. And so I wanted to be mentored by him, and he, he helped me a little bit, but he basically heard from the other partners there that I wasn't that good a lawyer, and so maybe we could get rid of him. So it was clear my clients didn't think I was that good either, and so I think there was a consensus that maybe I should do something else. And I'm sorry, can I just switch the mic? All right. <laughs> Already. I would say, as a general rule of thumb, things don't work 50% of the time, and now we've proven that. So all right, is this going to work? All right. So Ted Sorensen helped me get a job with a man to get me out of the firm. He got me a job with a man who was, um, he said, would be the next president of the United States, and I would be able to work in the White House just like he had done. Um, his name, he was running for president in 1976. His name was Birch Bayh. He, he did not get elected president. You may know this. <laughs> In fact, I became the chief counsel of his Senate subcommittee on constitutional amendments, which was the job he gave me, but he was running for president. Thirty days after I joined his Senate staff, he dropped out of his presidential campaign. So I said, uh-oh, I wasn't a great lawyer, and I had no political acumen because the person I thought would be the next president dropped out 30 days after I went to work with him. So some of you may have had the same experience in life, which is you wonder where your career is going, and that, this was at 25. So I got a call out of the blue, and some of you may have had such a call where somebody I didn't know, said, would you be inter interested in interviewing for another presidential campaign? I said, well, for who? They said, for Jimmy Carter. I said, isn't that the peanut farmer from Georgia? They said, yes, but he has a good chance. I said, look, I know a lot about politics, even though I'm young. He's not going to be president of the United States. <laughs> um, but I had nothing else to do, and so I got an interview. I got the job. I went to Atlanta. And when I joined Carter's campaign, he was 33 points ahead of Gerald Ford. And when I was finished, Carter won by one point. <laughs> As we have observed recently and in many years past, the people that fill White House staffs are not given those jobs on merit. They get there by working the campaign. So as you pointed out, at 27, I was the deputy domestic policy advisor to the president of the United States. Now, I knew I wasn't qualified. I didn't think other people on the staff were qualified. I didn't think Carter was qualified. So by today's, <laughs> today's standards, though, by today's standards, he's extremely qualified. But, <laughs> but, um, but you know, Carter had been governor of Georgia for four years. In those days, that was considered nothing. Now, it's considered a lot. But I, so I, one of my jobs is to fight inflation. I got it to 19%, which nobody's done since. Um, and some of you may have this experience as well. People came to see me all the time and say, you're a bright young man. If you ever want a job, call me up. Well, if you have an office in the West Wing, you're flying around on Marine One, Air Force One, you're going to Camp David, the last thing you're thinking about is going to practice law again. But we, we ran against Ronald Reagan. Some of you may remember this. And I said, please, dear God, let us run against Ronald Reagan. He's 69 years old. Nobody 69 years old can get elected president. He's too old. He's ready for a nursing home. <laughs> so now I'm 68, so 69 doesn't look so old. But be careful what you wish for. We ran against Reagan. He clobbered us. So the day after we lost the election, I called all the people who told me how bright and smart I was and said, all right, now I'm ready to be hired. None of them called me back. Because who wants to hire a Carter White House aide when, uh, you know, Reagan's in power? So January 20th uh, comes along and, and, you know, I have no job. So one day I'm at Paul Weiss, one day I'm a graduate of the University of Chicago Law School, one day I'm working in the White House, I'm working in the Senate, now I have no job. That wasn't so bad, I had to explain this to my mother. And she said, well, David, uh, what are you going to do on January 21? I said, you know, I have so many offers, I don't know which one to take. And so that went on from January, February, March, April, May, June. She kept saying, why don't you just take one of these offers? But I didn't have any offers because nobody wanted me. Finally, somebody felt sorry for me. They gave me an offer to practice law again at the bottom. And I worked my way up a little bit, but I realized I wasn't a good lawyer. My clients told me I wasn't that good, so I decided I had to do something else, and I got out of the practice law. And nobody has ever asked me to practice law again. I thought she wanted you to be the dentist. Well, my mother wanted me to be a dentist because she thought that was the highest calling of mankind. Uh, <laughs> now, the truth is, the highest calling of mankind is obviously <laughs> private equity. But, but she thought, you get to be called a doctor, and you have no weekend hours, so what could be better? Um, but I just... Didn't, I said to her, look, suppose I get arthritis in my fingers, my career will be gone. So I just I convinced her I didn't have to be a, a dentist. But So I, I got out of the practice of law, and I got in the business world. Okay. So, David, you don't have an MBA. Now, there's a bunch of MBAs here, by the way, along with our fellows MBAs. I wish I had one. There's also, well, so you've been a failure in business, right? No, no. But you don't have an MBA. So why did you start Carlisle? What is Carlisle? What is private equity? Okay. Uh, and you have often talked about that it actually provides a social service. What, what is all that? First, um, let me explain what private equity is for those who are not uh, informed about it. 
private equity is basically the business, and now that term is used in many different ways, but in, in outside the United States, it's often thought to mean synonymous with buyouts. In the United States, I think it should be considered all kinds of private investment. It could be venture capital, mezzanine, real estate, whatever it might be. But the essence of private equity is this. In the business world throughout most of history, uh, what people did was they managed, when people manage other people's money, they did something different than private equity. Let me explain. Uh, the Earth is five billion years old, and life on Earth is three and a half billion. Humans, as we know ourselves to be, are roughly a million years old, and Homo sapiens are roughly 300,000 years old. So let's just talk about Homo sapiens. For the 300,000 years that we and our ancestors have been on Earth, there was no need to manage money for anybody else. Uh, for 99.9% .9 of the time that Homo sapiens have been on Earth, they didn't worry about anything except shelter, uh, reproduction, and subsistence, just staying alive. Not until probably around the 1600s in Europe did people have enough money, not just the kings, to have a, give somebody else some money to manage for them to make a little bit more money than they had. It's called investment. You give somebody some money, they manage it for you, and you get more money back than you gave them. That's the theory of investment. All investment was either you gave people money to buy a bond or the equivalent of that, and you got back a, a, some dividends and eventually the principal, or equity, where you took a risk and you got back some capital appreciation. These were things that typically in the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s gave you for fixed income, one, two, three percent, equities, four, five, six percent. After World War II, some people came out of the U.S. military and they said, we have some, a new idea how to invest. We're going to create whole companies out of whole cloth, new companies out of whole cloth, and we're going to call this adventure capital. It's an adventure. And they went to people and they said, we have a new idea of how to make money. We're going to create new companies. We want you to get, pay us not a 1% fee, which is typically what you got for fixed income or for uh, public equities. You got a fee on the committed capital. You didn't actually have the capital yet, but you were going to, uh, when you called the capital down, you would uh, then invest it, but then you would get 20% of the profits, called a carried interest. And this uh, kind of ad venture capital produced for the early ad venture capital investors returns of 40, 50, 60% per annum, not one, two, three, four, five, or six percent. So people liked that and they flocked to this. They shortened it to called venture capital. Then in the late 60s, somebody came up with a very clever idea of buying companies that were already around but at discount from what people, what they thought they were worth. They, they called these deals bootstrap deals. You buy, you, you buy something and you pull yourself up for the bootstrap. So if you owned a company that you thought was worth a million dollars, because if it went bankrupt, your, your bank would say it's worth a million dollars, they would get, lend you a million dollars, I would come along as a bootstrapper and say, you know what, it's really worth two million dollars. And you would say, I'm an idiot, pay you two million, you'll say, I'll sell it to you for two million, I buy it for two million, but I am not thinking it's worth two million dollars in terms of the assets, but the cash flow off of it is maybe enough to sustain two million dollars of debt. So I borrow roughly two million dollars of debt, maybe I put in one percent of equity and borrow almost $2 million. And I make the company more efficient, and I sell it, and I make a 40, 50, 60 percent rate of return. So in the early bootstrap deals, later called leverage buyouts, these deals were spectacularly successful. So you had venture capital, buyouts, and after 1978, the Carter administration said it was okay for public pension funds to invest in this area. So not just wealthy people, but public pension funds could invest. The returns, because more people came in, went down, but the returns were still 20 percent per annum, 25 percent, and they were spectacular. So that was what private equity is about. It was investing money for the sole purpose of increasing the value of an asset by using various techniques and to get a very good rate of return for your investor. So I came along, not knowing all this history at the time, but I read about a man who um, had um, been the Secretary of Treasury under, Jimmy, uh, under Gerald Ford. His name was Bill Simon. And when he left as Secretary of Treasury under, Bill Simon, uh, under Gerald Ford, he bought a company called Gibson Greeting Cards, which he paid roughly $230 million for, almost all borrowed money. He put in $1 million, and that $1 million became worth $80 million two and a half years later. So I read about that and said, I don't know what a leverage buyout is, but it's something I'd rather do than practice law. <laughs> the problem was I didn't really know how to go do a leverage buyout, so I went down the street to Bill Miller, who was Secretary of the Treasury in the Carter years, and said, your predecessor just did a leverage buyout of Gibson Greeting Cards. He made $80 million in two and a half years. Uh, why don't you do that, and I'll give you my legal time and I'll be the lawyer for it. And he said, obviously, he knew my legal skills weren't that great, so he said he didn't want to do it. I think he didn't want to tell me he didn't want to do it because my legal skills were so bad. So he didn't do it. I then decided I would start the first leverage buyout firm in Washington and, and seduce 
other people who didn't know how bad a lawyer I was to come in and do it, and I would tell them I would raise the money. So I got three people who actually knew something about finance, told them that I would raise the money, and they, they came in, and we started in 1987. So I started it in part because I read about Bill Simon, but also I read that an entrepreneur will start his or her first company between the age of 28 and 37. And after the age of 37, leaving Mark Zuckerberg and Bill Gates' exceptions aside, uh, the chance of starting a new company after 37 is probably reduced, just like a woman's chance of reproducing after 37 or 47 goes down, you know, your, your chance of starting a company goes down. So very few entrepreneurs are starting new companies when they're 65. Some, but not many. So most entrepreneurs are between the age, age of 28 and 37. So I read that when I was 37. So I said, I better do it now, and that's when I started the company. And it, it was based in Washington, which a city people didn't take seriously for finance, but that enabled us to make mistakes and nobody would pay attention to us. <laughs> So you haven't made many. So, David, Carlisle, as I recall, is, is three pillars, right? There's three of you, basically, right. three founding partners. And uh, you have said that since you couldn't do anything very, very well, you decided you'd be the marketer slash fundraiser. So, right. David, all of us are marketers in life, um, you know, in, in some form or other, right. i.e., to be, you know, to, to persuade people to do what you want, you're a marketer. You are not a kind of used car salesman kind of marketer, in my mind, at all. So you've raised $180 billion. You are said to be the finest, most successful marketer in the country, in the history of the country. No kidding, I have read this. So how did you do that? How, how did you raise $180 billion? Well, obviously I had a lot of people that helped, but um, what I did was this. Um, in any organization, you have to make yourself useful. Um, just sitting there saying, hey, I, it was my idea to create this company, eventually people were going to say, well, that might have been nice, but we need people to actually do something. So if I say, well, I'm going to do the deals, I didn't really have an MBA, I didn't have the finance background, so what, do I, what can I do to make myself useful? I said, well, we're going to invest money, but we don't have any money, so I'll go raise the money. So I made myself into a fundraiser, and, uh, you know, in the totem pole of financial professional services, fundraiser is not usually considered the top, maybe dealmaker is, and fundraiser is the bottom, but I said, this is what I'll do, and I taught myself how to go ask people for money, and I wasn't by nature a you know, back-slapping, uh, uh, golfing, cigar-smoking you know, kind of guy. It wasn't my style. So I, that's what I thought fundraisers did. But actually, if you go out and you actually know what you're talking about, and you're willing to put the time in, you're persistent, you don't take no for an answer, uh, without being arrogant about you know, not taking no, you don't be impolite to people. Um, if you're persistent, you can actually raise money. And so ultimately, I started with family and friends and worked my way into concentric circles for, you know, around more and more people. And, you know, I would go to 70 countries a year and, and raise money, and ultimately, if you had a reasonably good track record, you could raise the money. Mm -hmm. Well, and you have. Wow. Um, so, David, you all own hundreds of companies, or you have owned hundreds. I don't know how many. Well, we own about 200 now. 200 now. And over the course of the, of the firm, many more than that. What, what do you look for in, in a leader? I mean, obviously, some of these you're buying to, to put a leader in, and some you, right. you're just... Well, let's put it this way. And when I'm hiring people to join Carlisle or interviewing people. What I look for are reasonable intelligence. I don't like geniuses because they're hard to manage and too difficult. I like people who are reasonably hardworking. I don't think they have to be obsessive, compulsive about hard work, but they work reasonably hard recognizing that nothing great is accomplished nine to five, five days a week. I'm looking for people that know how to work with other people. Their private equity is a team sport. So I like people who know how to get along. I want people that can know how to share the credit, people that are ethical, and also I want people that know how to communicate with others, they know how to write, they know how to communi communicate orally, and also they are people that when they make money, they're not just going to go hoard it and just say, look how rich I am, they're going to do something useful with it, to give it back to society, and, and to really make a difference in, in the world. Mm -hmm. Those are the skills I'm looking for. A leader of a company, when, when we, people buy companies in the buyout world, less than 50% of the CEOs who start in a buyout are, wind up at the end because they either didn't have the right skills for that particular kind of investment or they just didn't, weren't as highly motivated as they should have been. So you often replace the CEOs and you're looking for people that know how to motivate people, that know how to really um, get people to work harder uh, within reason and know how to uh, come up with a plan that's likely to make the company more valuable than it was before. Mm -hmm. So David, you're, you're, part of your great charm is your, is your humility, which is genuine, I know. Um, so you've told me about a couple of errors you made in the investment Every field. Day. I mean, what, tell us a couple of errors that you've made. Well, um, I could do, you know, every day I've got about 10 of them, but uh, <laughs> these are some that I made. Um, I, my daughter was an undergraduate at Harvard, and she met a young man that she's now married to. Um, he knew I was in the investment business. I guess to impress me, he said, well, 
you know, I, I have a friend who's going to start a company, and why don't you put some venture capital money in this, and it'll be a good deal. And I said, well, what does the company do? He said, it's a company that matches students from various colleges, and it's like a date service. Look, I said, look, I hate to be impolite, but I've seen dating service companies before. These things never take off, and it's a waste of money. So I am too experienced to want to do this. I said, what's the name of the company, by the way? He said, Facebook. <laughs> think that's going to get anywhere. So actually, if I put up the initial 10 million, that's worth about 35 billion today. So that was one of my mistakes. Another one was, <laughs> we owned a company called Baker and Taylor, which was the second largest book distributor in the United States. Started in 1839, had not made a profit since 1839. Never made a profit. <laughs> Always break even. And so uh, one of the salesmen came to one of our board meetings one day, and he said, guess what? I found a new way to make money. What is that? He said, some idiot showed up here and he wanted to rent our bibliography of books and print. He's going to sell books over the internet. Uh, and he didn't have a bibliography. But I, he said to me, this young entrepreneur, said to the salesman, I don't have any money. I'll give you a third of my company if you give me the bibliography. But the salesman said, I was too smart for that. I negotiated a deal. We get $100,000 a year for five years. So after about two years, I'm reading about various things. I read about a guy starting a company in Seattle called Amazon. He was selling books over the internet. So I called the salesman and said, you know, there might be another idiot who wants to rent that bibliography. He said, no, that's the idiot that we already got. Uh, so I said, oh. And we, we, did he offer us one third of the company? He said, yes, but we didn't, we didn't want that. We got cash. I said, oh, okay. So I flew out to see this guy. His name was Jeff Bezos. I said, you know, our salesman, he, he really wasn't that smart. Uh, we really would like to get one third of the company. He says, David, I've never met you before, but your company was very helpful, but I don't need you as much. Our company's now three years old, uh, but I'll give you some stock. So he gave us uh, a little stock in the company, and it, as soon as it went public, we sold it because we figured this company's going nowhere. And we sold it for about $80 million. Today it's worth about $3.5 billion. That was another one of my mistakes. That's how, oh, my goodness. Well, anyway, <clears throat> keeps you humble. Can't win them all. Um, so, David, now fast forward. You're extremely successful um, financially and, and other ways, and you've signed the, the uh, Gates Buffett Pledge to yes. give all your money away. Actually, it was only 50%, but you're giving it all away, right? I so you, you've often talked about the various ways you can give your money away, or what, what you can do with your money. Tell us why you've chosen what you've chosen. Well, what, what well, are the ways? Um, I, it, the, giving away money is a complicated thing in the sense that when you come from modest circumstances, you make a lot of money, and most people in the Forbes 400 who didn't inherit or marry it basically made it by coming from modest circumstances, and they had an idea, they pushed the idea to the extreme. Virtually nobody in the Forbes 400 who is very wealthy got there by saying, I want to get rich, I'll figure out how to do it. But they really wanted to have it. They had an idea. They wanted to prove it worked well. And making great sums of money was not probably their initial idea. It just came along. Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, uh, none of these people really thought they were going to make the kind of money that they, that they did. So when it's strange when you make a lot of money, all of a sudden you say, wait a second, I put the brakes on. I'm making all this money, but what am I going to do with it? You start giving it away. So it's funny. You're working so hard to make the money, then you're working so hard to give it away. So in my case, uh, when I was about 54, 53, Forbes magazine wrote an article saying I had a certain net worth, and I figured it was probably, probably right. So I said, okay, what am I going to do with the money? Now, here's what you can do with money. If you have a lot of money, you can do what the ancient um, Egyptian pharaohs did. You can build a pyramid and take all of your wealth and be buried with it. <laughs> There's no evidence that you actually need the wealth in the afterlife, so it's probably you eliminate that exception or possibility. You have three other things you can do. You can give it to your children. and. The truth is, most people throughout organized history, thousands of years, um, they, that's what most people do with their wealth. They give it to their spouse and or their children. And um, my view was that giving each of my children a billion dollars is probably not going to make them a Nobel Prize winner. Now, they may not agree with that, but I, I decided not to give all my wealth to my children. I think if you give your children unconditional love, support, a good education, you know, that's probably a, a you know, pretty good way to get started. And so giving them a staggering sum of money probably wasn't a great idea in my view. So then you have two other choices. You can give it away while you're uh, alive, or you can give it away after you die. And a lot of people, they're worried about they won't have enough money to live on, or they don't know what to do with it. They, they die, and they have billions of dollars that they give away when they die. It's nothing wrong with that. But I didn't, wasn't sure I would be in a place where I could see where the money was being given by my executor if I waited till I died. So I decided to give it away while I was alive. And so I embarked on a program to essentially give away my money um, while I was alive, and if I live a normal actuarial life, I hope I'll get there. But you know, if I don't, it'll get be given away after I die, and hopefully I'll see where it's going. But you never know. <clears throat> you, you've also said that you were really happy before you had money, and you're really happy now, and therefore, yeah. Well, well happiness is the most elusive thing in life. Thomas Jefferson, in this city, wrote a sentence 
that became the most famous sentence in the English language. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Unfortunately, in the remaining 50 years of his life, he never said how one attains happiness. And as we all know, happiness is very elusive. And very few people actually really attain happiness. They're, they struggle with it. The most unhappy people are really rich people who don't know what to do with their money. Uh, many billionaires I know are tortured because they family problems. They don't know what to do with their money. They just they made all this money. They don't know what to do with it. I, I'm fortunately not in that category. I'm, I'm actually pretty happy. And being happy and Jewish is very unusual. <laughs> <laughs> Write that down. That's a good one. So I am Jewish and happy. And I'm happy because I... Um, a couple things. One, I um, did some things in life that I wanted to do. I made, uh, you know, some other people happy. But the one person I made happy was the person I was most interested in making happy, which was my mother. Um, you know, my mother had no um, business understanding. And when I told her I wasn't going to be a dentist, she was disappointed. Um, when I practiced law, um, she didn't know what I was really doing. When I started a business, she said, you know, she didn't think I knew anything about business. It wouldn't get anywhere. Every time the stock market would go down about 100 points, she thought we were going bankrupt. Um, but so she never actually called me to say, well, you, Carlisle did this or did that. It's good. But when I started giving away the money, uh, she would read about it, and she would, you know, tell me she read about it. She's very proud, and she would read the article 10 times. She would say, I said, well, I say, look. The article doesn't change. You read it 10 times the same thing as the first time. But, but she would read these articles, and she was very proud. And so I called what I, the, the, the mother metric. If your mother calls you and, and is proud of you, and if she's Jewish particularly, that's happiness. So I got to be, uh, you know, I was very happy. My mother, um, uh, you know, and, and I was the chairman of the board of Duke. And the last um, year, last July, or la I was chairman until July, but the last commencement, I was the commencement speaker. And I, I invited my mother. I said, why don't you come to the last um, commencement at which I'll be presiding as the board chair? And she said, well, um, you know, who's the commencement speaker? And I said, it's me. And she said, they couldn't get Oprah. And so um, <laughs> no, they couldn't get Oprah. They got me. So um, she was going to come. And it was on Mother's Day. And, and sadly, um, she died about a week before. So I dedicated my speech to her. And it was Mother's Day. And I said, you know, I'm going to try to um, do more to um, give back to society because I know that's what my mother thought was the most useful thing I was doing is giving back to society and you know giving back to the country. So um, I try to rededicate myself to doing that. And, and I, I tell everybody here that I made a mistake with my father and I didn't quite make it with my mother, though I could have done a better job. Here's what it was. You know, I made a lot of money and I was starting to give away money and so forth. And I didn't do enough to honor my parents. Uh, while they were alive. I just didn't assume they would die because you know, if you have parents, you think they're going to keep living forever. So my father died in 85 unexpectedly. And so I, I said I, I should have done something that was alive. So I got a letter from a member of Congress saying the Iwo Jima Memorial is falling apart. My father was a Marine. So I repaired the Iwo Jima Memorial in his honor. And my regret was that I didn't do it while he was alive. So I resolved not to do that with my mother. So uh, as the chairman of the Smithsonian, I we have a lot of rehabilitation so going on. So I took one of the museums and gave some money to something, to, and I named it in her honor. But she didn't know it because she was very modest. So I brought her up from Florida. Uh, she lived in a suburb of Baltimore called West Palm Beach, Florida. And, um, <laughs> and so she, she oh, came good. up, and I showed her, and her name was on it. And she was so excited. There were a couple of Supreme Court justices there. So I was very glad to see her picture uh, of how happy she was. I just wish I had done more of that when, I was, when they were both alive. And so my advice to people who have the ability to do it, and not just money, is to honor your parents when they're alive, because it's a lot harder to do it when they're not alive. Wow. And it reminded me of, of a TV commercial that, that was done for AT&T. Bear Bryant was hired to do a TV commercial about calling your mother on Mother's Day. And he, he said, please call your mother on Mother's Day. I can't do that anymore. Oh, lovely. And so, you know, my point is, you know, honor your parents when mm -hmm. you can because you don't know how long they're going to be around. I, I don't know if my children have the same view, but. I uh, <laughs> will. Well, and I remember she met your father. Didn't they get married at 17 and 18? Only child? She was 20. She was 17. Okay, yeah. No, I met her once. Lo lovely woman. She's very proud of you. Um, okay, so you got all this money turning to uh, your philanthropy, which is right. what you're doing with it. So the Magna Carta was your first big document. It's a, it's a monster. Uh, why did you buy it? How did you buy it? Tell a quick well, okay. story about, about you know, how you bought it. In growing up in Baltimore in a blue-collar 
family back in and Baltimore, by the way, maybe, I don't know, Philadelphia as well, but Baltimore was the most rigidly segregated city in the United States by religion because uh, mortgages in Baltimore, and not unlike other cities perhaps, mortgages forbade you to sell a home to somebody who was Jewish or black. Now, that was outlawed by, outlawed by the United States Supreme Court in 1948, but Baltimore didn't quite get the word. So when I was growing up, they still had mortgages said you can't sell this home to somebody who's black or Jewish. So all the Jews had to build homes on their own in a certain area from northwest Baltimore. And, and, and so it was, um, you know, a very modest upbringing, and I enjoyed it. I didn't know anybody who wasn't Jewish until I was 13. I thought everybody in the world is Jewish, and I realized virtually nobody's Jewish when I got out of the Jewish ghetto I was in. But I, so I didn't aspire to buy the Magna Carta. Um, it wasn't one of my uh, ambitions when you were growing up. What happened was I was flying in from London to New York. I live in Washington, but I was flying to New York, and I'm going for my mail that I accumulated, and one thing said from an investment banker, um, why don't you come look at the Magna Carta? It's going to be shown at this place. I said, wait a second, I just flew from London. I assume there was one copy of the Magna Carta. It's in London. How can it be out of London and be in New York at, at Sotheby's? So I, I was interested. I went there. I knew the investment banker. He said, I got there. Um, actually, what the story is is that there are 17 extant copies of the Magna Carta, 15 in British institutions, one in the Australian Parliament, and Ross Perot had bought the only one in a private hands in the early 1980s. Uh, a family had it in its possession for 500 years. They went land poor. They needed to sell the Magna Carta or their land. So they decided to sell this. Ross Perot heard about it. He sent his lawyer, Tom Luce, over. The lawyer negotiated to buy it for about a million and a half dollars. Um, he then rolled it up in a tube, goes through British Customs. The customs agent says, what's in that tube? He said, the Magna Carta. He said, oh, sure. Go ahead. <laughs> so he brought it back. He put it in the display at the archives. But Ross Perot, for whatever reason, decided to sell it. I think he wanted to use the money for a very good cause, Iraqi war veteran uh, relief. And so the, the, the curator said, it's going to go for sale tomorrow night at the either, and she knew the likely buyers, and they were all from outside the United States, and I said, well, geez, that's not good, because this was the document that actually inspired our founding fathers. Uh, people, I knew enough about American history to know that the Magna Carta was not as significant in English history as people said. It was actually not. The original Magna Carta in 1215 was abrogated by King John a couple weeks after he, he put his seal on it. Um, and, and, uh, and there were several other versions of the Magna Carta. The only one that actually went into effect was one from 1297, not 1215. This is a 1297 version, so it had gone into effect. But when the, the our co our colonial colonies were being given their charters, they all said, you have the rights of Englishmen. And that was interpreted by the Founding Fathers to mean that you had the rights of the Magna Carta. So if you read the letters from the Founding Fathers when they're getting ready to pull away from England, they. Um, uh, they would say, we have the rights of the Magna Carta. So I knew it was important in our country's history. So I said, I'll tell you what, I went, I said, I'm going to go buy it tomorrow. And uh, <laughs> now, I didn't want to tell my wife, it sounds presumptuous to say, I'm going to go buy the Magna Carta tomorrow. And I didn't want to tell my children, they might say, how much less money might this mean for us? I don't know. So, so I went back the next day, I get there right in time, and I'd never been to Sotheby's before. Uh, so I said, okay, here I am, I'm ready to, to bid in this auction. They said, well, no, this is a complicated thing. Go in this little room, and they lock the door, and they put you on a telephone. And I couldn't quite hear. And what you wanted they were a paddle, really right? Didn't well, you want? Didn't well, you want? I thought they would have a paddle, but in the room they didn't have a paddle. They gave me a little telephone, and so I'm on the phone. And I hear them saying, "We're now going to argue, uh, auction off the Magna Carta." And uh, so I couldn't quite hear what they were saying. But you know, and if you've ever been to an auction, you know, you get carried away, and eventually somebody says this price, and I said another price. So eventually, I, I put a couple bids in, and then the guy said, "Sold." So I couldn't know who won. I didn't couldn't hear. I couldn't. Uh, I didn't know. I couldn't hear that well. So the guy came in, and the head of uh, Sotheby said, hey, you just bought the Magna Carta. Uh, who are you? Um, we don't know you. And by the way, you actually have the money for this? I said, yes, I do. And he said, well, look, you can go out the side door. Nobody will know. Or there's 100 reporters who want to know uh, who bought it. And I said, I don't mind telling people. So I went out and said, look, I'm David Rubenstein, and I uh, bought it, and I'm going to give it as a gift to the United States government to be a down payment on my obligation to give back to the country for my good fortune. And so I have put it on display. Um, with the National Archives, and when I die, it'll go there. I, I own it still because I, I uh, right. want to make sure it's displayed appropriately, but I, I had a case built for several million dollars by the National Institute for Standard Technology. It's a wonderful case, yep. and it'll be there for 800 years. Yep. And um, so I did that, and then I got in the habit of buying other historic documents for the same reason. I want them to be on display so people can see them, because if you see them, um, it'll inspire your brain to maybe learn more about American history. We know so little about American history. Right now, we don't teach civics in many courses anymore, in many high schools or junior high schools. We don't 
you can graduate from almost any college in the United States without taking an American history course. And even if you're a history major, in 80% of the colleges, you don't have to take an American history course to be a history major. And so you get ridiculous things like the Annenberg recently came out with a survey, I think it was, that three quarters of Americans cannot name the three branches of government. One third of Americans cannot name any of the rights protected by the First Amendment. And I think it was a survey by Pew that said a few years earlier that 35% of Americans, when asked, said that, that who was the first Treasury Secretary, said Larry Summers. Oh, and God. 30% of Americans, when asked what river did George Washington cross during the Revolutionary War, said the Rhine River, which happens not to be in our country. And amazingly, <laughs> amazingly, 10% in another survey said 10% of Americans, when asked, said Judge Judy is a member of the United States Supreme Court. Mm, wow. Which is not yet the oh. case. So. Uh, <laughs> So I, I think we should educate yeah. m Americans more about, about mm -hmm. this. And I think that mm -hmm. if you sit down in a computer screen and you just look at the Magna Carta, you can go through, right through it quickly. But if you actually take the trouble to go see the original, the brain mm -hmm. still works in a way where you're inspired to, mm -hmm. to think more about it once you've seen the original. And then you mm -hmm. might go back and read more about mm -hmm. it. Yeah. And so that's why yeah. I've done that. And yeah. the other things of restoring monuments or something, right. the same kind of idea. So David, fascinating. N not to get you into trouble politically, but because I, I know Tuesday you're going to the state dinner with the French Macron, right? So I don't want you to like be turned away at the gate. But let me ask a political, slightly political question. Um, the Magna Carta underpins, you know, a lot of our right. Constitution, Declaration, et cetera, our, right. our Bill of Rights. It's 800 years old. It's lived and it's breathed and it's created our documents and a lot of what we stand for in this country. Do you think? I happened to see Sunday in the Times, there was an editorial saying, you know, look, we don't have a king. It appears that we might, you know, someone in the Oval Office thinks he might be king. Right. He might not be subject to the rule of law, but in fact he is, blah, blah, blah. So without getting, you know, uh, terribly controversial, do you think these documents can get us through this time, uh, this dark time? Get, well, the, look, the Constitution uh, is a rare document in that it's still in existence with only 27 amendments, really, and maybe you could argue 16 or so, because after the original 10, um, you know, we, we, we had a limited number of amendments. Uh, it's been around for 200 plus years. Most constitutions are amended hundreds of times, and they don't survive all that long. Our constitution was designed in a fairly intelligent way with lots of compromises, and of course they had the, the um, fatal flaw in it, the genetic defect, the birth defect of slavery. Um, and people knew at the time that that was going to ultimately be a real problem, but we overlooked that for the time being. But leaving aside the slavery and the, and the imperfections that existed because of it, and then the after effects of trying to get rid of slavery, we, um, we have a pretty good system, and I think ultimately the rule of law does prevail in, in the United States. Richard Nixon learned that. So the rule of law, I think, is one of the greatest things we have in our country, and one of the reasons why I think the greatest place in the world in which to invest is the United States, because of the rule of law, you can be certain what the rules are and the law is going to be followed. So I don't think uh, we should look at the current situation as saying, uh-oh, the country's going to fall apart. The country, more likely, was going to fall apart during the Civil War. That's when we had a real problem in the sense that half the country or a large part of the country wanted to break away. We don't quite have that situation. So, And we've had other situations that are very, very severe in this country as well. So we have lots of challenges today. Uh, lots of problems with our government, but I still think it's better than any other government I've mm -hmm. seen. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a speed round now because I, I have to give you guys time for good questions. Um, here's my speed round. You get like three sentences on each one. Ready? Um, tell us about your top documents and the significance of them. Top documents? Yes. Well, obviously the Declaration of Independence, which is a propaganda document, has no legal force, um, is a document that contained that famous sentence that I mentioned, which inspired many people in subsequent generations to think that these were the principles that the country was really founded on. Thomas, Thomas Jefferson wrote that sentence, and the preamble, when he wrote it, he didn't think was very significant. He thought the other part of the Declaration would be significant, the part that said all the sins of King George. The preamble turned out to be the only thing we really remember now, and that was what, what uh, Abraham Lincoln referred to when he said four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth this con a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. The idea that all people are created equal, men and women have equal opportunity, is really the founding principle of this country. And I think that the Declaration of Independence, which has that, is very important. The Emancipation Proclamation, when Lincoln signed it on January 1, 1863, he, it was a revolution. The idea that, that you could free slaves and that ultimately with the 13th Amendment they, they permanently were freed, I think is, is, is significant. So I, I bought those documents as well. And obviously the Bill of Rights, which was the Constitution was ratified only with a condition, more or less, 
that we would ultimately have some Bill of Rights. That wasn't a, a legal condition, but it was a political condition that would probably be a Bill of Rights, and James Madison drafted it, and ultimately they, they, they got approved. Um, so I think the Bill of Rights, the Declaration, obviously the Constitution, Magna Carta, they're all significant documents. I can't say mm -hmm. one is more important than the other. I lent, I, on permanent loan, more or less, my uh, Emancipation Proclamation, one of mine, and one of my um, 13th Amendments to the new African American History and Culture Museum. And if you've never been there, I highly recommend it. It's a museum that the Smithsonian has built. Um, it opened in, in 2017. It, it's a spectacular museum that deals with the, 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 all the problems that, that African Americans have had and all the successes they've had as well. It's, it's uh, a public-private partnership, 270 million from the federal government, 270 million from the private sector. And there, those documents are there now. Okay, last question from me. Your Bloomberg TV show, which is really fascinating right. and you must all watch. Tell us your favorite uh, interviews and maybe a couple of things they've said. I'll tell you how it came about, if I could. Okay, yeah. Um, I became the, uh, at Carlisle we have annual investor conferences and so I would pay a lot of money to get a former president of the United States, a former secretary of state, and they'd make a speech and I could see a lot of people were falling asleep. So <laughs> for the amount of money we are paying, I thought I didn't want people to fall asleep. So I decided I would interview people and make it a little more lively and people liked the interviews. I had some humor in it. So um, I decided I would you know, try to do that from time to time for Carlisle. Then Vernon Jordan asked me to become the president of the Economic Club of Washington about 10 years ago. He said, just get one speaker every quarter, and then you have questions coming up in cards from the members, and you just read the questions, and that's it. So I started getting the speakers, and the speakers were very boring business people because they were reading something somebody else had written. Then the questions from the members came up, and they were worse. So I would pretend I was reading questions from the <laughs> members, but I was making them up. And they were funny, people laughed. So I decided to just go junk that format, I would just go interview. So I now interviewed lots of people. One of them was Donald Trump. I invited him to come in. And um, uh, you know, we, we had a lot of business people. I was struggling for somebody who would be a draw. And somebody said, Donald Trump. And I said, well, I'm looking for serious business people. And they, he's not that big a business person. But they, they said he has a TV show, he's a big draw. So I, we, he was right. Uh, we, we drew 800 people. I wrote him a letter, and he, and he sent a letter back to me uh, right away saying, uh, yes, I'll be there. He came to the green room and he said, David, thanks for doing this. I'm happy to do it. Um, ask me anything you want except ask for two questions for sure. What are they? Number one, ask me if I'm going to run for president. I said, president of what? He said, president of the United States. I said, Donald, you have no chance of being president of the United States. You know, you, don't you have told him? Oh, wow. I told him about it. He said, well, I'm going to write anyway. And then he said, I, the other question is, what's the other question? Ask me if my hair is real and then you can feel my hair to show that it's real. Oh. So, well, I'm ask it's real, but I don't want to feel it. So I asked him, uh, this question. We had a good, que a good uh, dialogue. And uh, one of the questions I remember asking, I said, Donald, uh, why do you want to be president? You have a better plane and a better home than the president gets. And he said, you know, it's a good question. I'm not sure. Um, you know, right, I do have a better home and a better plane. Another question I asked him was, Donald, um, lots of people like me, I don't really know what I should do from day to day. You know, sometimes I do this, do that. You never have any self-doubt. Do you have any self-doubt about anything? He said, what, do you, what is self-doubt? What is that? He said, he didn't really know. Wow. And when the interview was over, he liked it, and they called me the next day and said, David, I'm going to make you an honorary member of Mar-a-Lago. Oh. And you should know it's the highest rated show in the 40-year history of C-SPAN. So I called C-SPAN and said, what were the ratings? And they said, there are no ratings. So I, you know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, maybe, maybe he knew. I didn't know. But anyway, so... Uh, so I, so I, I, anyway, I did these interviews, and then ultimately Bloomberg people saw them, and they said, why don't you do this on TV? So I now, uh, these interviews, and Bloomberg is interesting because it's, it's all over the world. They have Bloomberg all over the world, so people see them all over the world. Now, Bloomberg people are selling them to airplanes, so if you fly airplanes, sometimes you see these interviews, and it's, it's fun. I mean, it takes me 45 minutes. I know the people I'm interviewing, and we do it, and it's not, uh, yesterday I did uh, Renee Fleming, the opera singer, and uh, Oprah was probably the most interesting, because Oprah, um, she's a force of nature, and I, I said to her at the end, um, you know, it's clear you don't need to be qualified or experienced in a traditional sense to run for president, so would you consider being running for president? And that's when she said, well, maybe I would, but I don't think she will. Um, I did also say to her, you know, I think you have a future in television. I think you really can make television a career for yourself. And she said maybe she would, so I don't know. Maybe she'll be in television. <laughs> well, they're fantastic. I've adored them, so you all need to watch them. Okay, you get 15 minutes, so I would love questions. Let's go back here. Yeah, I'm looking at you. Uh, hi, thank you for being here. Kevin Brown, an executive student. First, we have a connection. My grandfather is 89. He is a Marine and was a postal worker, so uh, okay, well, like your right. father. Um, so my question is, in Philadelphia, for example, we have uh, limited resources for our schools and infrastructure. We struggle from deep poverty. Uh, we cannot raise taxes for out of fear of driving away business. 
on the national level, we have a, a budget deficit struggle with um, inequality across the nation, where we lower taxes. At the same time, it seems like private equity hedge funds are, are booming, are making lots of money and capital. So to me, it seems like there's an inherent contradiction between sometimes our national ability to fund what's most important, our defense, our social security, our retirement, our, our schools, yet uh, there seems to be kind of this accumulation of wealth internationally in the private equity hedge fund sector. So how do we reconcile these two, seems bifurcation, a separation of, of struggling public you know, groups and, and business that's thriving and making more money than ever we thought they could? Well, it's a complicated uh, question. I'd, I'd say that uh, clearly the country is creating enormous amount of wealth for people in the upper income brackets, and people in the bottom are becoming poorer, not getting closer to the middle class. There are many reasons for that. I can't solve all those problems. If I could solve those problems, I'd be in the Iowa caucuses right now getting ready for the presidential campaign. I don't have an answer for that. I don't know who does. I do think that we are, um, it, the theory of, of wealth is that when you create more wealth, it kind of distributed somewhat radically you know, across the entire economic spectrum, but it's not happening. Right now, the wealthier are getting far wealthier, and the poor are getting, I think, poorer, relatively speaking. There are many reasons for this. I can't solve all those problems or explain it all, but one of the reasons is that many people drop out of high school or they're not being educated. Uh, take literacy as an example. Right now, 14% of the people in this country who are adults are functionally illiterate, which means they can't speak, they can't read past the fourth grade uh, level. If you're functionally illiterate, you have a uh, very good chance of going into juvenile delinquency system. 85% of juvenile delinquents are functionally illiterate. Two thirds of the people in our prison system are functionally illiterate. In the city in which I live, Washington, D.C., roughly 30% of the people who enter high school don't graduate. So if you have a lot of people who are functionally illiterate, they don't graduate from high school uh, or get a reasonable education, the chance of their getting to the top is not very good. We also have another problem, which is that um, income inequality is one issue, which is you have wealth disparities that are getting greater for a lot of reasons. You also have a lack of social mobility. In my case, I grew up in a very poor economic environment, but I believed in the American dream and I had the social mobility for a number of reasons to get to the top. Now, many people at the bottom don't, no longer think that it's worth working to try to get to the top. They've given up. And that is a, a separate issue than income inequality. And it's, it's more serious in some ways because you can maybe overcome income inequality at some point, but if you have given up and even trying to, you have no chance of getting to the top. These are issues that the people in Washington, D.C. or other government people are, are paid to figure out the answers to. I don't have the answers, but I, I think it is a serious problem. And, and at some point, the country will have to address this income in this disparity and this social mobility problem. Otherwise, the society will just not be able to function very well. To be continued. Yes, back here. Go ahead. Here's a mic. I'm Chris Freed, a graduate of Fells 2003. My question, you mentioned Amazon. Um, curious, what's your thoughts on how Amazon's pursuing their second headquarters? And if you could take it from a uh, Amazon perspective and also a local government perspective. Well, uh, Amazon um, is, I think, one of the great American success stories, leaving aside some criticisms that some people had of some aspects of it. Uh, the truth is, uh, Jeff Bezos started with a simple idea, a business plan that he, he drew up while he was driving across the country with his wife. Um, he um, struggled in the early years, but now, obviously now it's, it's a juggernaut and nobody has been able to kind of come up with a real competitor to it. Um, I, 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 his company is um, so strong that he just, he's hiring so many people that he just feels that he needs to be more in one city. So I have talked to him about it and he, you know, he's obviously going through this elaborate process. I think they've narrowed it down to a number of cities. Um, he told me that he would decide by the end of the year and so we still got time to go. I don't know where the decision is going to be, but I, I do think it's a clever idea. He said there'll be equal cities. Be, one won't be more important than the other. Um, it's never been the case that, except for some few companies, where you have two headquarter cities. So I do wonder whether at some point, you know, somebody will say maybe they should uh, split the various parts of the company up where you have the, let's say, the uh, cloud servicing business as a separate business and, and, and so forth. I don't know what, whether that will ever happen, but. But I, I do think it's a very clever idea. I think they now have, if I got it right, is it almost 500,000 employees or something like that? And uh, it's staggering how big the, the company's become. And, and, and uh, I don't know where he's going to uh, put the other uh, headquarters. Obviously, living in Washington, I think you know Washington has a good chance. But I think Boston, Philadelphia, Atlanta, I think in the East Coast makes more sense um, because he's already got something on the West Coast. But who knows? Yes. 
Go ahead. Hi, uh, Matt Forrest. I'm a full-time first-year MPA student here. Um, and whenever I'm in the room with fascinating people, I always want to know what book or essay do you recommend everyone you know reads and why? Okay. Let me answer it this way. Um, I, I grew up without having a family that really could afford to buy a lot of books. So the important thing to me was uh, getting books. So my mother took me to the uh, library in Baltimore. Uh, you know, we didn't have a car when I was growing up, so we, we, she'd walk me about a mile and a half. Or, you know, I don't make it sound like I'm Abraham Lincoln, but I'd walk a mile and a half to get the books. <laughs> and, you know, you could take, in Baltimore, you could take out 12 books um, on your library card a week. So I would take out the 12 books, take them home, and read them the first day, and I had to wait a week to get another 12 books. But I, I adopted a love of reading, and I now try to read uh, 100 books a year. And I try to read two books a week. And I do that in part by force feeding myself. I have a lot of programs where I interview authors. And so by interviewing the authors, I, I, I'm the principal underwriter for the National Book Festival. And so the authors come there. I interview a lot of them or at other programs I have. Adopted, I create a program to interview authors about American history in front of only members of Congress, to educate members of Congress. So I have to read the books. So I force myself to read them. I, I had to read physics books or chemistry books. I couldn't do two a week. But I read history, philanthropy, um, politics, business kind of books. And I can read them pretty readily. I don't know there's any one book uh, that I would say is going to change your life. I think a lot of, uh, there are a lot of great Pulitzer Prize winning books that I highly recommend. Uh, I, I, you know, I'd say if you had to take any one book anywhere, probably the Bible, because the Bible's, you know, got so much in it. But other than that obvious choice, uh, there's a very famous autobiography written by a man in this city named Benjamin Franklin, the first real autobiography. Pretty good book. Um, I'd say, uh, you know, a book that I've read recently is Annette Gordon Reed's book on uh, the Hemings of Monticello, which won the Pulitzer Prize. I just interviewed her recently. And a great book, I read another Pulitzer Prize winning book by Scott Berg on Lindbergh, which is an incredible story of, of, of what he did. Um, and I'm now working my way through Ron Chernow's book on Ulysses, uh, Ulysses S. Grant. I'm going to interview him in September. And you know, his book on, on Hamilton was obviously a good book. I don't know whether it's going to be made into a play or not. Is there probably maybe? <laughs> <laughs> he also said an interesting thing about Shakespeare, that if he had to tweet, what would happen to the English language? Uh, Shakespeare, you know, he was, let's say, the greatest writer of the English language, though he didn't go to college. You have to wonder how he could do all this without a college degree and so forth. But you know, and whether he wrote it or not, I don't know. If I could you know, ask him any question, I'd say, did you really write all this? Who knows? But I think that, that Mozart, Beethoven, Shakespeare, Thomas Jefferson, would they have been able to write all the things they wrote if they had to respond to tweets every, you know, minute? Or they, you know, I don't know, because tweeting, and we'll see what the literature is 100 years from now with people that have done tweeting. But you have to wonder, would Mozart, if he had to be interrupted every time he was doing a composition, would he have produced very much, or, or Shakespeare? Probably not. Yeah. Wow. Yes, Janet. Janet Haas, I'm a physician here at Penn, and I also um, oversee a foundation in Philadelphia. I have two questions, they're unrelated. Um, the first is, what are you looking to bring out in the people you interview? And the second is, no investor, no manager wants to talk about the future in the markets, but I'm a little bit curious about private equity, hedge funds, and so forth. There's so much money waiting to be invested. But what lies ahead? Where, where's that money going to go? OK. Well, on the first. Um well, let me tell private equity and, and, and hedge funds. Um, the theory of private equity and, and hedge funds was that you're going to get a superior rate of return. You're going to pay a higher fee, but you're going to get a superior rate of return. Today, because returns have been so bad in so many other areas for such a long time, people are willing to take lower rates of return. So it used to be that people wanted a 20% annualized net internal rate of return from private equity, let's say. Today, investors are actually pretty happy if they get 14 or 15%. Now, 14 or 15% net might not strike people 10 years ago was great, but today in this environment, um, it's, it's more than, than acceptable to people. And, and when there's so much wealth in the world, investors have so much money, if you can get 14, 15% net, that's still pretty good. And 20% is probably unrealistic on a sustained basis, we're putting out a lot of money. But so I think that investors are going to, uh, until we have the next recession, which is probably due at some point, we have, we have recessions every seven years on average. We haven't had one for nine years. We're overdue for one. We'll probably have one at some point. And when we do, in the, the, the prices will come down a bit, and, um, and people will buy things cheaper, and maybe ultimately returns will come up. I don't know where, where interest rates are going to go. Um, I hired a guy a number of years ago at, at Carlisle. He was a very nice young man, and I hired him. He worked for me for about eight years. 
and then he decided to do something else, and now he's the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, uh, Jay Powell. So, you know, I don't know what he's going to do. He's, I'm sure he's going to do a very good job in figuring out what to, what to do in terms of increased interest rates. But as they increase them, I, I think ultimately we'll, we will probably come to an economic slowdown at some point. And, but I think private equity is still relatively modest in this sense. Um, the world's GDP is roughly 55 percent as measured by purchase price parity in the emerging markets, 45 percent here. But only 17 uh, percent of all, all private equity dollars are going into the emerging markets, so-called. So you've got a larger gap there, and more and more of the emerging market uh, countries will get private equity dollars, and a lot of the gap will go there, I think. We'll see. Uh, your first question was the... What you bring out? Bring out in the interview. Um, in the interview, what I'm trying to do is to make people explain what it was that, that made them successful. What were, the, what were the key elements in their childhood, their young adulthood? What enabled them to get where they were? And people are, you know, people's, what is everybody's favorite subject? Themselves, right? So if you ask people about their family and their, how they got where they are, they, they're willing to open up. And I, I try to do this in a way where I, I'm not a journalist. I tell them I'm not a journalist. I'm not trying to embarrass you or trick you or not that journalists do that, but they don't have to be worried. So I, I give them the questions in advance. I don't actually ask those questions, but I give them the questions in advance so that it calms them down. And then I... And then, you, and then you ambush them. <laughs> and then I think of something, uh, you know, spur of the moment, it's good. And I try to have, have like three or four serious questions and one semi-humorous one to kind of lighten them up a bit and see whether they, they, they have a sense of humor. And some, some people do and some people don't. And then if they don't, you just keep going on. So. Good answers. Yes, I'll try it Go ahead. But again, the answer question, what makes them a leader? What made them tick? That's what I'm trying to get out of them. Yes. You spoke about, uh, my name is Zach Dunn. I'm a student at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. I know. You, you introduced me. You introduced yourself. President of the next I remember. class. I remember. <laughs> uh, small question for you, sir. You mentioned President Kennedy. Yes. I think when a lot of people think of President Kennedy, they think of space. They think of the frontier. They think of right. Americans being energized and inspired. Right. What do you think is the importance in the future of understanding our cosmos, interstellar travel, kind of pushing to the next frontier? Okay. Uh, thank you. Well, I'll answer it this way. I, I should have said in my philanthropy, when I look for things, I look for things that I can start that wouldn't otherwise get started, that I can finish wouldn't otherwise get finished, and that I'm likely to live long enough to see some of the benefits of it. So intergalactic space is not something that's got that much of my attention because I'm not sure I'm going to live to see long parts of it. Um, I think a serious question can be asked, other than the political ramifications of the moonshot, if we had not sent a man to the moon and we had sent a, a, a piece of equipment, would the world be worse off? Now, we'd have this human achievement, but you know, did we really accomplish that much by sending man there? I don't know. Maybe we did. But would we accomplish that much more for civilization if we sent men to Mars? I, I know there are lots of people who have signed up. I think 200,000 people have signed up to go to Mars when they're told they're not going to come back. But you know, I, I, I think there's, it's interesting, but, you know, in a realistic sense, I don't think that in our lifetime we're likely to know if there is life in outer space or in the other galaxies. And it's interesting intellectually, and I am interested in lots of things related to the Big Bang Theory and how the Earth works and so forth and, and the solar system, but I just don't know that it's something that we're going to see real answers to in the near future. When John Kennedy announced his so-called moonshot, it was, against, it was against the advice of all of his advisors. They all told him, it's silly, it's not going to get done, it can't be done, it's too expensive. And he overrode his advisors, and he obviously didn't live to see what, it, what the, the impact of it was. I think it has done a very good job in inspiring people to do things. And I think the greatest impact of the moon shot was not so much we got the moon and we have moon rocks now, but it's that some of the technologies we now care about, GPS, um, weather forecasting from satellites. Oh, so many things came about as a result of it. So it was very worthwhile. Actually, getting the men to the moon probably didn't have as much impact on our society as the other things that came out as the side effects of it. But um, I don't think you're going to see any president sending anybody to Mars anytime soon. The cost would be too great. And I don't think that side, the benefits would be that immediate. Yes. Uh, Linda Hall. How should we, how do you think we should, thanks. How should, um, we improve our democracy, our government? Well, that's a simple question. Um, <laughs> well, um, that's, there are many answers to that. I do think that the problem with the democracy that we have now, uh, though it's better than democracy in other countries, is that 
we are so partisan in Washington that, they, that the Democrats and Republicans don't talk to each other. Um, you can't pass a major bill that's bipartisan, by and large. The last, the, the Obamacare passed with no Republican votes, the tax bill with no Democratic votes. In the old days, the 70s or 60s, Democrats and Republicans voted uh, for bills uh, you know, together. Um, I think the three factors that I cite are probably causing this problem are one, the rise of money. It used to be that you didn't need, to need, you didn't need that much money to get elected. Now, people don't need that much to get reelected, though they need more than they did before. But you, you raise a lot of money, you scare people off from running against you. So you raise the money to announce how much you have. And secondly, you now can give money to other members of Congress, so you buy you know, chair, committee chairmanships. Committee chairmanships are not necessarily on seniority anymore, so you can you know, influence other members by giving them money. So that's why they raise large sums. Um, and by raising large sums, you have to spend time at it. You can't call up to ask money from your office, so you have to do it from someplace other than the congressional office. And they also spend a lot of time outside of Washington. So that's why the voting schedules are generally two to Tuesday or Thursdays. So they're not spending any time with each other. They don't socialize. They don't know each other. Families are, by and large, not living there. So as a result, um, that's a big problem. The second problem is the gerrymandering that's occurred in the House. So if you're a Republican, you probably have a safe district. If you're a Democrat, you have a safe district. It's been gerrymandered that way. And that means that you don't have to appeal to the middle that much. And third is the rise of social media, uh, talk radio, the internet. Everybody knows everything you're doing. So you can't make a vote in a subcommittee without it offending somebody, uh, possibly. And so everybody's afraid of doing anything, and they're afraid of any vote. So we have no votes in the Senate anymore. Uh, McConnell's general view is not have any votes. And actually, Harry Reid before him didn't want to have any votes either. So they just don't have any votes, because if you have a vote, it could be a, a, a dangerous vote. So they, we just don't have any votes. They don't, they, they don't do any voting. They have very few votes of any consequence. It's, it's not a good system. Uh, those things, if we could ever fix them, fix them, that'd be great. I think if we could get money out of politics, that'd be wonderful, but it's a constitutional amendment. Uh, in the uh, Supreme Court, we basically said it's free speech, so it's a sad situation um, uh, today. That, you know, there's no limits on, on giving money. There used to be $1,000 per person, went to 2000 Now there's no limits. You can give all the money you want. And, you know, and if we were a banana republic, we'd be calling this corruption. We don't call political contributions corruption. We call it political contributions. But in any other country, we would call it corruption. Whoa. Well, on that happy note. Um, OK, last question. From a student. Do I see a student in the back row? Do I see one? I do. Yes. Hi, my name is Alyssa Kress. I'm a first year executive student. Um, and I work at a Jewish organization, a happy Jewish organization, I like to think. Um, and we talk a lot about honing our story to tell the stakeholders and potential donors. And I'm curious in your philanthropic efforts, which certainly you talked about some that are really personally uh, connected to you and kind of your criteria for, for giving. But what about an organization story or a pitch to you really resonates? What are you, um, what kind of moves you to give? What kind of moves? What you moves you to give to an organization? To, to, uh, to, to get people to give money? Or? No, what, what would You personally to, you? to give what money to, to, to an organization. Oh, what, what, what moves me? Well, uh, most people like their own ideas better than somebody else's ideas. So if I have an idea, I generally like it better than somebody comes to me with an idea. That's number one. Two, I like to have things that are along the lines I said earlier. Something that I, my money can make, get something to start that wasn't going to otherwise get started. So when I went to visit Monticello a few years ago, I thought it was need of repair. I said, how much money will it take to fix it? And they told me, and I said, OK, let's do that. And I thought I could live long enough to see the repairs. And, and I wanted the slave quarters to be built out so we could see that Thomas Jefferson, for all of his strengths, was a slave owner and it was a plantation. So I like something that I can see I can get started, or I like something I can get finished that otherwise couldn't get finished. And um, like when Mount Vernon was trying to finish their capital campaign, they were struggling a bit to get some of the money. So I, I said, I'll finish it for them. And, and so those are some of the things I like to do. And I like to have an intellectual connection to it so I can understand it and, and feel I'm involved in it. And as I like to remind people, philanthropy is an ancient Greek word that means loving humanity. It doesn't mean rich people writing checks. So you can help people with your time, your energy, your ideas. And I try to remind people, if you don't have money, give your time. That's your most valuable commodity. Um, so I, in the Jewish connection area, I would say that I gave a speech last Monday night. It was a complicated speech to give. I was the keynote speaker at the 25th anniversary of the Holocaust Museum. And it's a complicated, you can't use a lot of jokes in that uh, environment, right? <laughs> so um, it was a very serious speech. It's on the internet somewhere. And uh, th that's a cause that, uh, you know, a lot of people who are Jewish really care a great deal about. And, uh, and I was in the White House when we, we got it off the ground. I, I look for causes or things that I have some understanding a personal connection to and I think that I can make a difference if I got involved, but you know, nothing beyond that. 
Thank you. Um, so last question really for me. Um, I know you're heading off to the Barbara Bush funeral this evening after you leave us. Um, and I know that, they, that you admired both yeah. Barbara and her husband. I thought I'd just give you an opportunity to, to tell us why. Yeah, um, George Herbert Walker Bush is not somebody that I knew when he was president of the United States. I had worked for Jimmy Carter in, in those days. I just didn't know very many Republicans. Uh, um, but after he lost the election to Bill Clinton, um, I went to recruit Jim Baker to join my firm. And he didn't really know me. It was a small firm. But I convinced him eventually. And I found out why he was so successful. He was Secretary of Treasury, Secretary of State, and Chief of Staff, and a very competent person, one of the most competent people I've ever met. He said, I have a friend. And maybe he could help us in some ways. And who's your friend? George Herbert Walker Bush. So he um, you know, did some things with us. And I got to know him. And I'd say he's the, the nicest person I've ever met. Not the nicest president, but the nicest person. Just so gen genteel, just so caring about other people, smart, focused, a fairly happy person in terms of all the things he's involved with. Um, so I really, really admire him. But I got to know his wife, Barbara. And Barbara. Um, and they called her the enforcer in the family and, uh, because she was tough. And, uh, you know, but she had a, a biting wit that um, it was, it's just, you know, you can't make this stuff up. You either have it or you don't. And she was very, very funny. And the family was always afraid of her. The grandchildren were afraid of her because she would always make them clean up. She would make them, you know, do what they're supposed to do, eat what they're supposed to eat. Uh, but she was wonderful. And I, I went on many trips with her. And I remember I was thinking the other day I went to on a trip with her to some safari. And she took every one of her grandchildren on a trip every year, uh, different ones to kind of get to know them better. And we went on a safari. And uh, you know, one time an elephant is getting ready. It looked like the charge, or the hippopotamus is going to charge her tent. And you know, they told her that, and she didn't seem to worry. She couldn't care less. She was just very laid back, very easy to deal with. And uh, in George W. Bush's book about um, uh, his father, he actually had a part about his mother. And he told me, you know, it's just typical of his mother's wit. Um, you know, he's running in a marathon. And, um, and he's running, and his mother's coming out of church. And, um, you know, he, and he's going along, he's sweating, he's barely can able to do it. And she yells out, George, hurry up, there's a fat person ahead of you. <laughs> so, anyway, so he worked harder. But she, she's always, uh, she was very witty. Um, she, um, one of the things that she inspired me to do is this. Uh, she created the Literacy Foundation, Barbara Bush Family Literacy Foundation. Um, and I've been deeply involved in that and other literacy things. And uh, you know, she's the one that reminded me how people in this country really don't read as much as they should. Um, as I said, 14% of the people in this country are functionally illiterate. And amazingly, there's the other problem of illiteracy. 30% mm -hmm. of college graduates never read another book in their life. And 50% of Americans have not bought a book or been in a bookstore in the last five years. Wow. Uh, so it's a problem, and uh, I, I, uh, mm -hmm. she was a very incredible mm -hmm. person. Well, thank you, David, for representing thank us you. there. But <laughs>